Hi there, it's Allison Miller, Division Director of Behavioral Health Education for HCA's West Florida Division. Uh, it's a gorgeous day here in Florida. I hope it's as lovely there as it is here. Today we're going to be talking about the BROSET Violence Checklist. It is a six-point checklist that helps staff to be able to assess whether or not someone is at an increased level of risk for violence. And the higher the score is, the more the chance for violence there is. It's been shown in many research projects to be highly reliable, and it's an easy scale to use. I want to talk about it today in terms of the uh, ANCC um, board certification, because it's something that could very well pop up on the uh, board exam, and it's good to know what this is. Plus, just in terms of practice, you should be utilizing this scale on your own unit. It's easy to get a hold of, and it's very effective and easy to use. You can train people in a matter of minutes on how to use it. So let's review what the six signs are. <clears throat> the first is confusion. Okay, It means that the person is uh, disoriented. Uh, they may not know the day, the time, the place. Pretty straightforward. We get lots of patients that fall into that category. But even one point on this scale may indicate a six-fold increase in risk of the person becoming violent. So don't discount when somebody becomes confused. It may be the first of many steps towards becoming more increasingly um, more agitated and then violent eventually. So the first one is confusion. You want to assess for confusion. The second is irritability. Does the person find everything um, irritating? Are they snapping at people? Are they sort of barking at people when they're answering? Um, do they want nobody around them? Those kinds of things would qualify as the person being irritable. That would also get a point. The third one is boisterousness. Boisterousness, boisterousness means being loud and uh, noisy in general, sort of maybe charging around the unit, and slamming doors and things like that. Um, it may also mean that when they talk, they sort of bellow at people. Um, sometimes you may say you're shouting and they go, I'm not shouting, but that's being boisterous, okay? The th fourth is uh, verbal threats. Verbal threats are, com they come off in two ways. The first is that they actually are using words that are physically, that are verbally threatening, right? They are describing ways in which they might hurt somebody. Or they're, they're threatening people um, and warning them to back off. That kind of thing can be a verbal threat. The other way that verbal threats would be qualified is that somebody is um, saying something fairly benign, but they're saying it in a snarling, threatening tone of voice or with um, facial expressions or body language that makes the, the words have greater impact. Um, so I hope that that's clear. We're talking about two things, words themselves that are actually literally threatening and then words that aren't threatening them in and of themselves but are being presented in a threatening way. Okay, that qualifies as being verbal, uh, th verbal threats. The fifth is physical threats. Raising a fist at somebody, pointing their finger and going, right, that kind of thing. Uh, those are, those, even those benign things that we get used to on the unit aren't really benign. They are indicators of thoughts of violence. They aren't yet violence, but they are getting there. Um, when they take an aggressive stance, they raise their arm, they throw a, you know, they, they threaten to punch. Something like that can be a physical threat. When it gets to actually attacking objects, that's the sixth sign. When they are kicking over chairs, they're um, throwing things across the room, they're breaking furniture, or they're breaking, even taking a, a pencil and aggressively breaking it um, can be qualified at that point as attacking objects. As the person goes up this scale, it's intuitively obvious, I think, that the person is becoming increasingly dangerous. But don't let that fool you, because even if the person only has confusion and irritability, the increase in the risk that the person will become violent becomes incredibly high. So this is a, a very reliable scale and something that we should be using I would suggest using it at the beginning of every shift. If you're running a 12-hour shift, maybe you want to do it twice a shift, depending upon how the mood on the, shift, on the unit is going. Um, but if you're running three shifts a day, I would do it 
at the beginning of each one of those shifts and do it on any patient who is um, showing signs of being um, threatening or irritable or confused or any of that. Um, it's also good to do it on patients that are showing no signs of it so that you can record that the patient was at a zero for several days and then when there's a change in the patient's behavior you've got some data that shows this is new right or if the patient has been sort of coming in and out of confusion you it helps to document the um, number of times the patient has been recorded as being confused it's a really good tool to be using I highly recommend that you initiate it on your unit if you're not already using it so a positive answer for each one of these is a point um, zero is considered to be a low risk it's not considered to be no risk right our patients are always at risk for violence so it's considered to be low risk a one or a two is considered to be a moderate risk and remember the research shows that even one of these increases the risk of violence sixfold from zero if it's three or higher it's very high risk and interventions have to be taken when somebody scores positive on any of these right so the kinds of interventions that we can do when the patient is confused is to help them reorient reassure them put up anything that's going to help them stay oriented um, when we're talking about irritability asking if they have felt this way before and if anything else has helped them to feel less irritable would a PRN medication help take the edge off would going for a walk help um, would just having a quiet environment going and sitting in the sensory um, room, the, the room that is quiet for uh, patients who feel overloaded. Uh, would any of those things help? You really want to address these early and get them under control so that nothing else pops up. If the person is boisterous, talking to them about how they are um, disturbing the unit or how they are, they seem to be upset. Uh, my rule of thumb is to focus on comfort, not control. So I don't approach patients who are boisterous as, hey, we really need you to calm down. That is not the way I approach it. I approach it as, hey, George, you seem kind of agitated, upset. You, you, your volume is up. What's going on? Tell me about what's happening. Um, they may have just had too much caffeine or something. Uh, they may be having a reaction to a drug, but you want to uh, be in the mode of being comforting and not trying to get them to control. Um, when you square off against a patient and you try to set limits on them as opposed to find out in a kind and gentle way what is going on, they can escalate in a nanosecond, catastrophically. We've seen it on video. So um, remember the mantra, comfort not control. If a patient is doing verbal threats, maybe it's time to sit down one-to-one -one in a safe environment with other people around and talk about why they're so angry and what we can do to help them feel less angry. I always try to help the patient, um, uh, to be empathic to the patient's anger by saying, you must be very uncomfortable to be this angry. Um, and that often gets the response of, yeah, it's awful. Okay, now we have a, now we have a common ground to work with. Let's work on making you more comfortable and feeling less angry and then the patient and you are working in collaboration so remember comfort not control when a patient is showing any of these symptoms at some point if they start to become uh, aggressive um, and they're attacking objects or God forbid they're attacking attacking people then you have to do more physical interventions that's obvious that you have to bring that situation back under control for everybody's safety the patients yours the other patients everybody concerned. But prior to that, helping the patient to feel understood is a great intervention and um, usually will de-escalate things a lot quicker. Squaring off against the patient just doesn't work. It just escalates things. So I wouldn't recommend it. All right, so that's, um, that's the lowdown on the bro set violence checklist. I highly recommend that you look it up online if you don't use it in your facility already and become familiar with it because it's very likely that it will show up on your um, board certification. But even if it doesn't, it's a good thing to know. Hope you're having a good day.